Dear Hannah, I've been doing a lot of running lately. It's an excellent way to stay in shape, obviously, but that's not really why I do it. Mostly I just like the fresh air and the freedom. You know, it gives me time to think. An hour or so with only my MP3 player and the pavement for company can really put those office blues and relationship issues in perspective. Like it all seems a whole world away. Not that it's an avoidance tactic either. I really feel that this time to myself, just thinking, helps me deal with my problems in a more level-headed and effective way when the time comes. I heartily recommend it. Just be careful, I guess. I don't quite know how to say this. A couple of weeks ago, you and I had this huge argument. It's funny, I kind of forgot what that argument was even about now. But like I said, the running, it takes your mind off of things. So, I was stressed, you know? Needed to get out of the house, pound the pavement a little, take my mind off of things. I decided upon one of my favorite routes. In a city like this, you've pretty much got to resign yourself to the urban scenery. But there's a nice little park not too far from where I live. You know the one. I'm sure we've been there once or twice. Now, ordinarily, I'd avoid the park after sundown. Just common sense, really. But I needed a little greenery to improve my mood. I decided that I'd do a circuit around the outside of the park, close enough to be scenic without being too reckless. It was about 10.15, so while the streets weren't exactly deserted, you could go quite some time without passing another pedestrian or even seeing a car on the road. I was glad for that, though. Usually my mind can only wander freely if I'm completely in a world of my own and solitude always helps. I was glad at first, anyway. As I saw the dark outlines of the trees that line the park come into view, I became dimly aware of a weird, creeping sense of unease. I was unable to drown out this irrational feeling with music, because it was around this point my iPod began to malfunction. As I got nearer to the park, the reassuring sounds of the White Stripes Seven Nation Army, its classic motivation song, if a little overplayed, it was steadily overtaken by a weird sort of static, unlike anything I'd heard before. It almost sounded like a quiet but persistent cacophony of voices speaking or laughing, but mingled together so as to create a single unintelligible sound. I made note that I had one more thing to deal with tomorrow. Creepy as the sound had been, a broken iPod made me all the more determined to calm my frustrations with a nice long run. But still, I was starting to wish that there had been a few more people around, or that it was a little lighter out. It would have been better, even, if the moon weren't hidden behind a dark, foreboding cloak of cloud. But I pushed on. I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? Well, I'll tell you. As I began my circuit around the outside of the park's three-foot metal fence, the large central field came into view through a break in the tree line. In the day, the field would be occupied predominantly by people playing sports, football, frisbee, running like myself or whatever. Obviously, that was not the case at night. But neither was the field empty. A muffled cry drew my attention to the figure. Well, two figures, near the center of the field. One is holding the other as though in an embrace. In fact, at first seemed like they were kissing, or possibly that the larger one was nuzzling the smaller's neck. It seemed an odd time and place for romance, but I kept on running. It was no business of mine. On the field, the larger figure suddenly jerked its head up away from the kiss. I was becoming less sure. It released the second figure who seemed to be falling to the ground. But the view was obscured by trees as I ran. At this time, I felt no need to stop and watch. The scene had increased my sense of unease, but 
I was still able to convince myself it was just a couple of weirdos macking in the park. As the trees thinned out, however, my illusions were swiftly shattered. The second figure was indeed laying on the ground now, and the first was crouched over it. This stopped me in my tracks, though it was difficult to see in the dark, and I still wasn't totally convinced that I wasn't accidentally peeping on someone's weird outdoors sexcapade. But then that moon that I had been wishing for earlier came out, and suddenly the scene, bathed in the stark white light of the almost full moon, was given a disturbing clarity. While the distance still made details a little difficult to make out, I could see clearly enough that the victim's body and limbs were jerking about violently as the hulking form crouched over it, ripping and tearing, feeding. The moonlight must have illuminated me too because of the thing in the field stopped suddenly and looked directly at me. I wasted only a second of standing there, panic struck, but that second will haunt me as long as I live. The two eyes which I couldn't possibly had seen from where I was, even if they were glowing, burned into me. I could feel it looking at me. No, it wasn't just that though. I could feel it smiling at me. With huge, jagged, uneven teeth crammed haphazardly into a maw still bloody and red from its latest meal, it smiled. I knew that much. I didn't see it. I sure as hell didn't imagine it. I just knew. And then I ran. The road I had been on ran parallel to the park, and there were a few turns along its length, so I knew I had a long way to go before I'd actually be putting distance between myself and the thing. I chanced a couple of glances at the field as I raced down the middle of the deserted road, moving faster than I'd ever thought possible, even as an experienced runner. There was the victim, left sprawled carelessly on the grass. No sign of the thing. I looked back to where I was headed. And there he was, perched languidly, mockingly on a streetlight right in my way. How the hell was it so fast? Now this was just my first good look at the thing. Blood was still dripping from the wicked claws at the end of the arms that hung, disproportionately long, past the light on which it squatted. The mouth still grinning, was exactly how I'd seen it in my mind, and yet, somehow even worse. It covered a large amount of the creature's face, more than seemed biologically possible. The eyes glowed with a faint red intensity, and overall, the thing put me in the mind of some kind of giant, emaciated monkey or deformed hairy man. I was trapped, there was just no way to outrun the thing. I wasn't even sure I could start running. Up close to the thing's gaze was absolutely hypnotic. My limbs felt heavy. My eyes began to burn. And I just wanted it to be over. And slowly, a loud rushing sound filled my ears. And suddenly, the thing hopped nimbly from the light and into a nearby tree, disappearing from sight. It was gone, but I felt heady. It was as though I'd been marked in some unknowable way. My eyes still burned. The area around me seemed to grow lighter, as though illuminated by a pale light. The rushing sound only grew louder. And then, it hit me. The car, I mean. Now, don't worry, there's no major damage. Apparently the driver had seen me in time to slam on the brakes, so just bruising mostly. When I awoke in a hospital bed, the doctors told me I was a lucky man, but I'll admit it, I didn't feel so lucky when I saw that flash of red eyes and yellowed teeth through my third floor hospital window. Anyway, I wrote you this letter to explain why I wasn't at the hospital when you came to see me and why you haven't seen me at all since. And well, I've been doing a lot of running lately. 
pray for me. Love, John.